So, so you're shooting a... Here on. once again, Indian Market in Santa Fe. Amazing how fast this past year has, has flown by. All of the events and all of the political turmoil is kind of upsetting everybody that I know. Everybody that I think is talking about the political situation and a lot of them are just frozen. They're paralyzed. They don't know what to do. And uh, the big thing in, in a lot of these circles is uh, the upcoming election. <laughs> Everybody's getting out to get rid of the president's signs. And the last uh, several weeks ago, in uh, Orm's 89th birthday honoring, which is really <laughs> an amazing event, so many people came from all over the world, uh, Orm just mentioned the thing about value change, that if we don't change our values, environment doesn't mean anything, politics doesn't mean anything, education, technology, you name it, it all boils down to changing values. And I've been thinking a lot about that, and it's true, it's true. Yeah. It's just the values of not being taught, they're not being carried through. And one of the areas that kind of stuck to mind is that even though the framers of the Constitution heavily borrowed on the Haudenosaunee tradition and the peacemaker tradition, they left out one thing, the clan mothers. I'm just kind of thinking, whoa, maybe it's the Supreme Court. But no, these are old white men again, except for two. But their focus is not really to bring justice to things. They're there to rule after the fact. And I was hoping coming here today to kind of ask Orrin to give some kind of advice or some kind of a statement on matriarchal values. How do we bring them back? How do we uh, hopefully elect a, a female to bring about a paradigm because these white, old white men will leave their shoes at the gate of the White House. The next one will come in and just step right into them as if nothing, they don't even change their socks. They'll just step <laughs> into them and, and walk in to do more of the same in varying de degrees. So I feel that it's so important that we really look at a matriarchal uh, society with matriarchal values and hopefully elect somebody that will espouse them. So the question I have of Orrin is what is it that went wrong in not accepting the matriarchal way of life? Mm -hmm. Well, Harmon, I've got to make a correction right now. Uh, the terminology patriarchal and matriarchal uh, indicates that there's a leadership in one or the other. And so the correct terminology with uh, Native women at the Onondaga Nation, women or Six Nation women or any women, all women, put it, put it that way, it's matrilineal. Matrilineal is not matriarchal. The matriarchy says they are in charge. Patrolino says we're all equal. Uh, and so that's what we have, you know, at the Haudenosaunee, known as the Iroquois Confederacy, based on uh, partnership. Partnership. <coughs> Three. Three partners. It's the men and women and the spirit. The, what people call, um, well, they have a lot of names, you know, for, for that spiritual side of um, this herd position. It's when we have <clears throat> meetings, when we have 
um, organizational events, when we have medicine events, when it's always uh, the men, the women, and the spiritual side. There's three sides to it. The, uh, I guess the, the obvious history and discussion of what you're talking about in a contemporary fashion is um, the annual meeting that's held in Switzerland well, every winter, mid-February, February. It's called the Davos, the Davos discussion. And at that time, that's two weeks of international discussion by world leaders, basically uh, corporate leaders and uh, political leaders. I didn't see any spiritual leaders there when I was there, but then I was only there one time. So the definition has to be very careful to be noted that the relationship between men and women is a partnership. One is not in charge of the other, it's equal. And it's the partnership that uh, builds the welfare of the generations coming. It's. Uh, it's the other half of the circle, all right? I mean, we talk about the circle of life, we always use the circle, circle, the big emblem. Uh, so you can't have what you call patriarchy, half a circle, because that's a man folk. So where's the women? So if you have matriarchy, there's women, but where's the men? So what you have then is you have to have the two of them together. That makes the circle. And that's your never-ending spiral of life, as far as human beings are concerned. And um, I think that's the issue that we're <clears throat> in discussion with right now, is the future of uh, humanity as a species. We're at high risk now of uh, eliminating ourselves in any manners of ways, you know, it's not just one way, but they're all, all of them end up the same way as uh, human beings are gone. By their own hand, by nature, by combination. Uh, we're at a, a crisis point in whether we're going to survive as a species. So in that discussion, of course, in, in most of nature that I know about, is always male and female. Always. That's how everything operates, you know. And so uh, what's been lacking in leadership for as long as Europeans have been in charge is uh, the women's voice. You know, the consequence of the situation of, of humanity today you cannot accuse the women of doing that, because they've been silenced as a, as a uh, as an entity. So who is responsible for the situation we have now? Our men folks. They've always, you know, it's the king. Sure, That's it's the, the king. Says, yeah, it's a monarchy, hierarchy. So when they came here, you know, just. Five days ago, we have this terminology where a day could be a year or it could be a hundred years. So I'm saying five, five days ago, you arrived here and look at the mess we're in. Now, you've been here only five days and we brought a crisis to the whole world. Now, in the philosophy of our, our confederation, we're, we're told that our responsibility is for future generations and that what we do has that consequence to the future generations and they talk about seven. That's, you know, and they're talking about the full lifetime of a human being. They're not talking your 20-year generations. Right. Uh, you know, Western society has been no, noted for shortcutting everything, you know, so <laughs> shortcut a generation to 20. Well, it's 80, you know, by, 
So anyway, um, here we are. Here we are today. Last year we had a discussion in this very same place, and a uh, dire discussion. It was about a lot of things that we were concerned about and for the welfare future and everything. And a year later, our discussion is very same, except that it's more intense because in this past year, we've gone the opposite direction. We as a human species, we're contrary to life in the future. So then, um, as I was saying, I learned about the English language uh, very early. And uh, it's a language that has uh, duplicity in it. It can be very misleading. It has different meanings. Same word, it'll have a different meaning, used in a different context. And if you don't know the, different, the difference in those contexts, you have not understood what was just said to you. And can be misled. Yeah. And, and it has been, and it's been used as a tool. And, you know, Native people are notorious for not having gone to school, you know. So, both good and bad, because schools teach you how to be a productive uh, automaton in the structure of, of an industrial nation. Right. You become a cog in a wheel, make it work for somebody, uh, somebody's profit. And, and so I think that the discussion has to be clarified um, and what's lacking in uh, any discussion, any, uh, at Davos in particular, uh, you cannot introduce a moral perspective in that discussion. It's not about morality, it's about profit and loss. Absolutely, that's all it is. So, the industrial age has come 360 degrees around. Well, it's, it's the uh, corporations and the industrialists that are meeting there, of course. And that's all based on consumption. Everything is based on consumption. Um, and of course, the other factor that's involved here that people are really not paying much of attention to uh, is the explosion, the compounding of human population. It's very serious. And that's really causing the crisis that we're in right now because uh, there's not enough natural resources to service the population as we see it, seven point seven, probably seven point seven billion as we sit here. It's a lot of people. A lot of people. And so the issue of water, you know, water is foundational issues. We know, we've heard it from everybody that the wars are gonna be fought over water and that's exactly what's going on now. And I would say, uh, probably, if water was adjudicated fairly, there would still be enough for everybody if it were adjudicated fairly, but that's not the way it is. Use of it, not to squander it. Well, you know, people have, have uh, countries have been developed and, and uh, national borders are a serious event. If you travel and you go into a country, you have to go through a border control. Very serious one. They may or may not let you in. Depends on you know what your credentials, if you have any. And of course, that's what's going on. You know, on the southern border of the United States and Texas right now, and and Arizona is the migration, the people coming north, and the whole discussion about credentials and identity. And so, uh, it's a. Uh, a serious discussion around the world, because as far as 
I know every country in the world has these borders. The uh, European Union, of course, <clears throat> really tried to challenge that. And uh, you can travel within the European Union without that border problem. Uh, and that's positive. I mean, <laughs> that's an effort to, to deal with the reality. And um, But it's changing now because of the unfairness of the adjudication of water and resources. And so the migration of uh, people from uh, Sudan or from Africa or from these different places seeking some, some relief, some sense of humanity, yeah, some sense of... Environmental degradation. Yeah, yeah, they're fleeing because they can't live there. And so we're now facing a crisis in water right now. I mean, that Mideast battle is about water. So who wins? They may win a war, but there's still no water. Now what? So would it be better, you know, to put your arms down and say, let's deal with this issue of survival of the human species and understand that we're all relatives, that we're, we're brothers and sisters, we're closely related. But uh, it's not a matter of color, although that's the issue that's been created. It doesn't matter what color you are um, in terms of uh, survival. In other words, uh, we can change blood with one another. Whether you're black or you're white, it may be that some black person is going to save your life or some white person is going to save your life, whatever. But water, but uh, blood is a commonality among the human species, so we're a species. We come in all sizes, all colors. It's like dogs. Dogs come in all sizes and all colors, but they're all dogs. And human beings the same way. We're all human. So we should understand that better and, uh, and treat ourselves as family. Responsibilities of seven generations all of our nation leaders around the world and national leaders should be concerned about the future generations. They should be preparing a better life for them. They should be uh, working more diligent on that than building armament or building building where, where the money is. So I guess in a long roundabout way what we're talking about is adding the moral question to the discussion about uh, commerce. So commerce is um, just that. Commerce requires a uh, consumer. It's interesting to me here as a native of Turtle Island that they now called America. It's interesting to me that the consumer that will fuel the support of the commerce is not being given enough wage to make that consumer. He's here in the United States, I don't know what it is, seven, $7.25 or 50 cents or whatever it is, it's, it's not livable. But that's what they call here a minimum wage. And they're saying, we wonder why we're having this stagnation. It's because your consumer doesn't have money to consume. You, I would say, captains of industry have directed, you know, your your profit out of their hands, and now you don't have somebody working for you. So, <laughs> where's your reality here? Certainly, you don't know how to build anything. You have control, or you hire and fire people, but you yourself will expire any minute because you just don't know how to survive. Take it outside of the context of, of a monetary life. And so, in the terminology of the Haudenosaunee, when we say seven generations, literally we mean seven generations. And literally, it's not a 
It's not a uh, philosophical remark. It is a, it is a directive. Well, we mean that when we say seven. Seven generation now. We. You yeah, we're we're a seven generation. Seven generations back, somebody was looking out for us. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Yeah. Now, if you can look at it in that context, when you have a responsibility to your children, grandchildren, and on and on, to their welfare. Yeah. I think that's been shortcut. And no one's thinking of the next seven generations. But today's generation here, at least in the industrial world, is profiting at their expense of their generation. They're not going to have anything that you have because you're using it all up here right now. And actually, how much can you use as a human being? How can you have a, you know, the top 1% here in America, they say, owning 40, 50, or what does it matter, 60% of everything in a country, this tiny percentage of people have that. And what do they do with it? What can they do with it? You know, at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, you're going to face the reality of death. You're not going to live forever. You can't live forever. You won't live forever. You're going to die. And if you don't have some kind of an idea what's on the other side, uh, it's not very pleasant. And the process of how you're going to die now is, is really being developed because if we continue in the direction that we're going right now, the end of humanity is going to be fierce and awful, awful beyond description. And I used to think, now I'm, I'm pretty old at this point compared to everybody else in life. I'm past the limit of losing a lifetime. So every day for me is like a a gift, but you who are listening or who are, you may experience now this damage that's coming. Yes. That's coming so fast. I was listening to two young girls, 13 and 14, being interviewed on how to see the world. And the shocking part about it is this, yeah, we know we may only have 15, 20 years to live. Therefore, we're not going to be using plastic straws, plastic cups. And it, was, it seems like a, they weren't looking for change. They were looking at it to reduce some of the industrial waste. Oh, to put it bluntly and flatly, it's industrial it's crime against humanity. Yeah. It's a crime, what you're doing to those children. It's a crime. Yes. It's nothing less. It's a crime that would demand severe punishment. And you're in charge. So these young children, I have uh, two great granddaughters now. I'm concerned. I'm very concerned about what kind of a life they're going to have. And the best that I can do at this point is, is uh, work towards a better life for them. With a I mean, sufficiency to be able to grow their own food, well, uh, self-reliance. Well, what I've said is that, you know, as you grow up uh, through life, you know, you have your, your, your great youth, you know, when you're just running and learning and everything is new and your parents are looking after you and, oh, it's great, you know, and you're just learning and then you're transitioning into being able to reproduce life. And if you don't result, then uh, your quality as a mother or father is going to be very difficult for this young person that you just brought into the world. And so the responsibility for that lies with your mother and father and your grandmother and your grandparents to give you instructions to how to how to deal with this new life that you've created and your responsibility to it. And so uh, that's not happening these days. And uh, it's not happening because there's a compound reaction 
in place right now in the explosion of, of humanity itself. You know, if you go from 2.5 billion people 69 years ago to 7.7, I would say now, quite easily, 7.7 billion people today in the course of one person's lifetime, you better understand what the situation is. Yes. That's, that's not happy news. That's not happy news for the environment. It's not happy news for all the rest of the world or other people. We're in a crisis. And the only way to meet that crisis is to share, to share equally, which is very contrary to the idea of capital and capitalism. And so, you know, here in the United States, you can't even use the word social or socialism. You know, it's just like uh, letting off a, a, a bomb or something. What? You know, but on the other hand, that's the only way you're going to survive. And you one percenters, you're going to go down in flames like everybody else. And you're going, to be, you're going to be the ones crying the hardest because you don't have the stamina, you don't have the training of, of being poor and, and surviving. You don't have that. You don't have the strength of your character. If you're strength of your character, you'd be sharing. That's my message to you people who are in charge of all of this capital in the world. No, it's going to be sharing. You know, always learn that. So just that sharing concept brings us back into a political change. It's not going to happen independently when there is no uh, energy to make that change. And if I can kind of go back into how to make a matrilineal change to the society to allow it to grow and to flourish. Now, you know, a lot of it can be with uh, native communities and tribal. I know the Pueblos around here in Santa Fe, they're all getting into farming, they're all getting into back into a family support. Well, that's, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the battle, uh, the, the, uh, the presidential run of, of Hillary Clinton as the candidate, um, she was defeated. And that gives you the attitude, the prevailing attitude of male domination yet today. She was defeated mainly because she was a woman. And that was, uh, that was the uh, thinking that came over in the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, that thinking. Over here, it was matrilineal. Everybody understood the importance of the mother. And she was the hearth and the center of everything, and still is, actually. I mean, where would we men be without women? You know, that guy boggles the mind. But then, you know, uh, I think China had a had a policy to have only male babies, and now they come a, now they've come a cropper. Now they've got the result of that kind of um, patriarchal thinking. This is where patriarchy comes in. So. Be that as it may, around the whole world, we, we're in trouble. We're in trouble physically, we're in trouble politically, we're in deep trouble spiritually, because what I see is there's just, people don't have a relationship with the spirit of the earth and, uh, and the world itself. And they say, well, that's, uh, that's religion. No, no. Catholic Church is religion. That's a religion. That's, That's a philosophy. That's <laughs> well, now look at the trouble. Yeah, yeah. That took a long time. That took a long time from uh, Columbus, and at that time in, in Europe and in, in the 
powerful at that time, most powerful entity in the world, and at least the, the uh, so-called civilized world, was patriarchal control. And uh, now we have a result here. And so, so the question is, uh, what are we going to do about it? Or what can we do about it? And probably more to the point, how much of it can we do in a very short time? From our perspective, and I'm speaking now, you know, on behalf of not only the Haudenosaunee or uh, Iroquois, we've been here a long time, uh, but also other Indian nations, other indigenous people around the world, that they have, and we have, uh, a long, a long perspective. We have a long history. We can look back a long ways and see what will happen, and we can look forward. It used to be a long ways, but that's shortened up now. But we see forward as well. And so the values then, the fundamental values that drives the family structure, that drives the the uh, national structure that drives the collective of a global structure is fundamental to survival. So that terminology, value change for survival, came from a coalition of leadership that was meeting on that issue precisely. And that included world leaders around the world. It included world leaders, it included religious leaders. In fact, it was called uh, the spiritual and uh, political, I forget precisely what it was, but it was a combination of political spiritual leaders for human survival. And at that time, that discussion was precisely where we are right now. Yeah. And making a request, I made a request to the leadership but we were meeting in Tokyo in 1990. I said, okay, we've met some, some years now. Um, what's our, what's our uh, result? What, what, is it, what, what is it that we're, we're, we've found out? I said, you know, we should check that out. And it was agreeable. It was agreeable to leadership. It was, okay, let's put that out there. It is set it to the meeting of all these diverse leaders around the world meeting in Tokyo. And at the end of the day, they said, we have an answer. What is the answer? Value change for survival. If we don't change the values that are driving the world today, we're not going to survive. Well, that observation hasn't changed at all. In fact, it's become more evident and more realistic why we said that. Because now we're, receiving, we're seeing the result of the values that have been driving uh, humanity, uh, which is commerce, consumerism, basically. Capitalism, they call it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they knew at that time, you know, you know, if you go back into uh, statements made back in 1700s, mid-1700, early, they were saying, yeah, we know that it's really not a good idea, but it's the best we got right now. But the idea is they knew that this was it. This, this was, let's put it bluntly, capitalism is not democracy. It's, it's, not it's, even it's, close to democracy. Capitalism driven by greed, more and more and more. It's, and so when you have a country based on that philosophy, when it's... Uh, and be chastised for using the word uh, social or socialism or, or sharing. But fundamentally, to put it bluntly, if the people of the world don't share what we have equitably, we're done. We're done as a species. Not, not complicated. Not at all. It's not very complicated. on a neighbor to neighbor basis. It has to begin with everybody. Yeah. You have to extend the sharing that you do with your children to your uncles and to your grandmothers, to your extended family, to your neighbors, to your uh, fellow person around the other side of the world. You have to share. 
heresy in the philosophy of American U.S. government today, and a lot of other governments. It's not, it's not this one. It's not the only one. So, so in order for us to make this change, we have to understand this uh, direction, this understanding of the changing of values. The values can no longer be for self-ownership development or accruement of wealth or security or whatever. It has to be making sure that your neighbors have good health, making sure that your neighbor's children have something to eat, and making sure that if you have something, you share it with them. And with that, it's not over. I don't think it's over. As far as the Haudenosaunee is concerned, as far as Native people are concerned, we're in this fight. We're not, we're not giving up. I mean, we've been through more than most people. We've, we've suffered 500 years of persecution, prosecution, death. You just name it. And we've gone through it, but here we are. And what are we saying? Hey, brother, we're going to do this together. You got to forget about this. This is a common cause for our survival as a species. Nature is the boss. Nature is the ultimate authority. And if you don't abide the rules and the laws that govern life on this earth, you're just not going to survive. You know. You know, you may be. Matrilineal a chance. <laughs> oh, well, <you're> saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Mama, Mama, give Mama her due. And, uh, you know, we all understand per, on a personal basis the importance of your mother. And then, when, as we were told way back in the beginning, the earth is your mother. And the earth has life, gives life, and you abide the rules and laws, you prosper, you'll enjoy that. And uh, if not, there's no mercy in nature. There's none whatsoever. There's only the rule of law. Everybody's experience. Oh yeah, that no, doesn't pay attention to the cries at all. It's implacable. So we really create like a little focus going forward uh, on some of the social, political changes, because uh, we do have a social platform now. I mean, there is something to the word of social media. We are right here, sitting here, potentially reaching out to four and a half million people that are certain to reaching out to 40 million people. I mean, the numbers are exponential in, in social media to plant the seeds uh, for matrilineal values, to bring back and respect one's mother, physical and uh, natural and, and the like. It's a good idea, Harvard. Just got to do it. And so what does that take? That takes adults to grow up and act like adults and take the responsibility that they're supposed to have for everything. And uh, recognizing that life isn't just in the human beings, that your relatives, your relations are surrounded by. You have to look after everything. You have to be concerned about everything. And uh, you get that perspective and begin to work together I'd say we've got a chance. Uh, and I think as we approach the points of no return, quickly coming, we have to affect change in our leadership and we have to affect change within ourselves. And the change has to happen within yourself before it can happen any other place. And so there it is, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm just a runner, and, uh, you know, people, uh, I don't know what they think, but I'm just an ordinary person like any other ordinary person. It's just that I accepted a responsibility, you know, from 
my clan mother and to the chiefs to help out and do what I can. And that's what I've been doing, that's all. Not nothing more, nothing less. But it requires time and sacrifice. It requires you to broaden your perspective. You know, when I first said, okay, I'll, I'll, do, I'll try, you know, and I was thinking about the Onondaga Nation. And then I said, and so I was sitting there, this, and I said, oh, wait a minute, what about the Mohawks? What about the Cayugas there, you know, the Senecas? Oneidas and Tuscaroras, I said, they, they, need, they need my help too, you know, and then I said, well, gee, what about the Navajos? What about the Cheyennes? What about, you know, and my perspective was broadening out, and I was saying, to them, well, what about those people that live around the other side of the world? What about those people that live down the road? You know, and then my perspective was broadening and the responsibility and like it just was just a natural development of uh, awareness. And I became aware of what our responsibilities are as a human being. And so I think if you if you begin with yourself, not easy. It's not easy. I felt some of the criticisms already. <laughs> of course. And you're going to Facebook jail out there. <laughs> and if you can, uh, you know, understand who it is that's behind all that. Sure. You've got to know your enemy. You know, there's a very famous, <laughs> to me, one of the most famous statements that I've seen that encapsulates everything. And it was, it was a cartoon character, Poco. And he says, I have seen the enemy, and it is us. Yeah, yeah. And they're going to be truer words. That's it's profound. Words, it's deeds. It's deeds. Yeah, now we got to do what we got to do. Share your wealth. Divest. Uh, help people. Take care of your children. Grow up. Act like a, an adult. Put your toys away. Put your toys away and act like an adult now. And well, maybe we got a chance. But I know our nations, Indian nations, who survived our horrendous history here of death and destruction, forced removals. You know, you talk about deaths, marches, thousands of people died. It's history that's not told to the public. The public doesn't know about it. It's been denied them in order to continue this whole idea of accruing wealth. Not to you, but to the best 1% of the people in the world. You don't prosper by that. I remember one time I was talking to uh, uh, a laborer. We're in construction. You know, digging ditches is what we were doing. And he says, the white guy, well, I know what I got to do. I said, we're, 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 uh, we're a capitalist country. I'm a capitalist. And I said, no, you're not. I says, you're labor and you're digging the ditch. I says, the capitalists live someplace else. Uh, you're not a capitalist. <laughs> you're you're the labor force, yeah. and uh, and now it's the capitalists have carried out their mission. I would say, wouldn't it be time to say, hey, I think we took a wrong turn here somewhere. What are we going to do? What are we going to do for our children? What are we going to do for the future? That's it. It's a good fight. I mean, what else are you going to do? You're just going to shrivel up in a corner and I think stand and fight. People, uh, turning off to their TVs and cell phones and not engaged. Stand your ground, folks. They're the only ones. Yeah. Well, we're with you all the way. That's us. It's we. We is the word. Inclusive to everything and everybody, all life, everything that grows, everything that it's our responsibility, it's our relative who are related. And that's what uh, Lakota has that, all my relations. 
When they say all my relations, they talk about birds, flowers, bees, trees, tigers, lions, mice, and men. They're all part of the chain. They're all one. They're all this together. <clears throat> so I'd say, you know, I'm going to curl up in the ball. Let's get out there and fight. Fight is on. Good one, too. And I'd say, it's not done. It's not done yet. That's nice to know. Yeah. Yeah, the warrior spirit is still strong. Yeah. Yes, yep. uh, there was one saying in the 70s, there is no power like the power of the people when the power of the people is unleashed. Well, so, it has to be more than that. It has to be focused. Yeah. It, it has to be focused. That's it now, folks. You have to not just get mad out there and start doing bad things in a big mob. I said, Focus your energy to where it's going to make a difference. You have to change the direction of leadership, basically, and you change your values. Okay, once you change your values, then you can change others. And so it's a challenge to uh, humanity. It's a challenge to our, our future generations. And uh, I think it's this generation right here, right now, and the next one. That's going to determine the fate of humanity as a species. Man. Keep fighting. Thank <laughs> you so much. Keep That's right. Well, I'm just a runner, runner for the nation. <laughs>